Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today, we're going to have a little heart to heart about a question that I wish more people asked before they clicked I agree and went about their day. Are you the product? Not in the metaphysical sense, no need to light a candle, but in the simple practical sense of who profits when you browse the web. Because if you've ever wondered why your internet service has gotten faster, pricier, and suspiciously more personalized over the years, it's worth peeking under the hood of the only two pieces of information about your online life that still leak out by default. The IP addresses that you connect to and the domain names that you look up in DNS. And of those two, DNS is the loud one. It's the gossip-loving Mrs. Kravitz with the bay window and the binoculars. I'll show you exactly what your ISP can see, what they can infer, and how that turns into money without anybody ever emailing around a spreadsheet called Dave's search history. We'll also talk about why the thing you're usually told to buy when you get privacy nervous, a VPN, doesn't often change the facts of the matter, and how you can actually make a dent with something that's both more boring and more effective, encrypted DNS. If that sounds too simple to be consequential, stick around. DNS is the who you visit of your traffic, and the who is the valuable part. Let's start by rewinding a click or two and remembering how the web actually serves you a page. First, you type example.com into your browser. Your computer doesn't know where example.com actually lives, it only speaks in IP addresses. So it essentially looks it up in the phone book, the DNS resolver, to get the number behind the name. Once it has the number, it connects to the server and says, hi there, I'd like to speak TLS, and then proceeds to perform the cryptographic equivalent of a secret handshake. And then from that moment on, the bytes flowing between you and the site are wrapped up in encryption so tight that even the NSA can't read the page you requested, the password you typed, or see the video frames that you're watching. Mm -hmm. That's HTTPS at work. Good guys one, eavesdroppers zero. But before the encryption shields go up, there's the shout you couldn't avoid, your DNS lookup. Where is example.com? If you ask that question through your DNS server that your ISP provides, because your home router handed out their resolver address over DHCP and you never thought to change it, then your ISP hears every one of those questions. Not what article did you read on the site or what's the total of your shopping cart, because HTTPS keeps that under wraps, but which domains did you ask for, when and how often? If you think of your browsing as a book, DNS is like the table of contents. Not the pages, but enough to know what the book is about. And this is where get a VPN barges onto the stage like a stagehand who's memorized his single line. There's a reason you've never seen me pimp for a VPN product. And I want to say this much up front. For most day-to-day -day web browsing at home, a consumer VPN is almost pointless as a privacy measure. Not useless, just orthogonal to the problem that you actually have. HTTPS already encrypts your content end-to-end. -end. Your ISP can't read your Gmail or your banking session with or without a VPN. What they still do see is the mapping from names to numbers, that DNS lookup, and the fact that you're sending packets to a handful of destination IPs at certain times of day, such as your bank. Now, a VPN will hide those two things from your ISP by shoveling all your traffic into a single encrypted tunnel and handing that off to a provider in the cloud, who then makes those same DNS lookups and connections on your behalf. So congratulations, you've moved the vantage point from your ISP to your VPN provider. If your adversary is a sketchy coffee shop Wi-Fi, that trade-off can be worth it. But if it's your home ISP, you've simply exchanged one set of logs for another. You changed who the product could be. You didn't change that somebody was the product. So what is it your ISP can actually see? Well, if you use their resolver, they can log every domain your household asks for, timestamped. And they can measure patterns. Nightly binges of Netflix.com, morning bursts of Mail.Google.com, Grandpa's Lunchtime Pornhub, and a worrying uptick in PuppyAdoption.net. So even with HTTPS, those DNS queries reveal the sites that you visit and a surprising amount about you. If you don't use their resolver, they can still see your destination IPs that you connect to. Less informative because content delivery networks multiplex thousands of domains behind a small set of IP addresses, but enough to correlate you and get a decent sketch of what's going on. Add in a little math and some common sense and anonymized telemetry starts to look suspiciously like a personal portrait. Now, before we break out the pitchforks, let's talk about how that visibility gets monetized in the real world because there's a gap between what's possible and what's profitable. Mainstream US ISPs aren't generally wheeling around a cart labeled raw DNS histories, get them while they're hot. That's too radioactive legally and reputationally. Instead, they distill the data, they aggregate it, they bucket you into interests that are just specific enough to be useful and just fuzzy enough to pass a giggle test. Your household becomes a sports enthusiast cluster with weekend travel patterns, or a cord cutter family with gaming spikes. Those categories power two money makers. The first is marketing, sold as anonymized trend data to brands and agencies, or used to target the ISP's own ad inventory. 
and the second is product. Once an ISP learns that you stream 4K during prime time, they can cross-sell premium latency or enhanced security the same way a grocery store suggests gluten-free crackers after you buy some almond milk. Ew. Historically, some ISPs even milked mistakes. Type of a domain name and you land on an ad stuff search page that said, well, did you really mean? And that's DNS air monetization. It's less common now, but it's a perfect example of how they slice the visibility and turn it into cash somehow. There are a few guardrails. In the U.S., internet privacy rules were loosened in 2017 when Congress repealed stricter FCC broadband privacy regulations. Since then, the FTC and a patchwork of state laws have really set the boundaries. And the upshot is that direct sale of personally identifiable browsing histories is a non-starter, but inference-based monetization thrives. So your ISP may not share the exact list of host names that your modem asked for, but they'll happily package your inferred interests. In Europe, GDPR treats DNS logs as personal data and the defaults are stricter. The point isn't that ISPs are cartoon villains. It's that the incentives point at the pile of gold in your metadata and responsible companies find ways to mine it that fit within the letter of the law. So a VPN is mostly just reshuffle who can see the breadcrumbs, but what actually shrink the breadcrumb trail itself? Well, encrypted DNS, or specifically DOH, or DNS over HTTPS, and DNS over TLS, or DOT. So it's the same old DNS questions, but they're now whispered in an encrypted tunnel. If your phone or PC sends its lookups to a third-party resolver over DOH or DOT, think Cloudflare's 1.1.1.1, or Google's 8.8.8.8, or Quad9, or a custom DNS provider of your own, then your ISP sees only an encrypted blob to that resolver and the destination IPs that you ultimately connect to. Crucially, they don't see the domain names that you ask for. That's a big change to what can be logged or inferred at the network layer. There's a second, newer privacy layer we're writing alongside, ECH, or Encrypted Client Hello. Under HTTPS, one metadata leak that lingered was SNI, the server name indication that your browser sent in the TLS handshake to tell a shared server which certificate to present. That name used to be in the clear even when everything else was encrypted. But now, with ECH, the server name itself is encrypted too. It's not everywhere yet, but between DOH and DOT for lookup and ECH for the handshake, the juicy bits leak a lot less than they did even just a couple of years ago. Before you march off to your Windows control panel, though, let's be precise about what problems we're solving and which ones we are not. Encrypting DNS to a third-party resolver stops your ISP from seeing the domain names that you type and the domain names that your apps quietly call home to. It does not make you invisible. Those destination IPs still exist. A determined observer can do statistical correlation. You asked for no names, but right after that you moved a couple hundred megabytes to an Akami Edge node that hosts only one major streaming app. What could it be? They can guess. Sometimes they'll guess wrong, because CDNs are like noisy digital apartment buildings, but strong patterns will betray you. And that's why privacy is always a matter of reducing attack surface and never eliminating it. So let's get practical. If you want to stop being the unwitting product, the highest leverage change you can make is to take back control of your DNS from the default path that your ISP hands you. On Windows 11, you can set secure DNS in the network settings and choose a known resolver. The OS will use DOH system-wide, not just in your browser. On macOS and iOS, you can install a DNS profile that points at a DOH or DOT provider. Android 9 and newer has a private DNS option. Type in a DOT hostname like dns.quad9.net or 1.1.1.1 and your phone stops shouting to the lobby. If you prefer to just keep it in the browser, both Chrome and Firefox support secure DNS. Flip it on and pick your resolver. But the upside to doing it at the OS level is that every app gets the benefit, including the chatty ones that never asked your permission to talk. Prefer to solve it all at once at the edge? Well, run your own recursive resolver at home. Unbound on a Raspberry Pi or AdGuard Home or a Pi Hole front end that forwards upstream over DOT. Point your router's DHCP at it so that every device in the house uses it by default. The nice thing about running your own is that you can choose to log or not to log and, or log only enough for troubleshooting and then rotate those logs out. You can also decide what to block, malware domains, trackers, whole ad ecosystems, without installing a half dozen browser extensions on every gadget. One gotcha though, some browsers now ship with built-in DOH and will happily bypass your local resolver to use their preferred provider. If you want all roads to flow through your Pi, you can disable the browser's auto upgrade behavior or block the well-known DOH endpoints so that the clients fall back to your local DOT. And that's not villainy, it's just making your network's policy explicit. What about the free resolver you point to, though? Aren't they just a new place where you become the product? Well, that's the trust trade again. Cloudflare's 1.1.1.1 is audited annually and commits to short retention. Google Public DNS is, well, it's Google. 
Each has their own privacy policy and has an architecture and a business model. I think the real secret is to pick the one whose incentives you can live with. If you don't like any of them, run your own recursive resolver that talks directly to the root and TLD services. That won't be that snappy without a big cache, but it keeps your questions on your own box. Let me also say a word about anonymization because that's the fig leaf that you hear a lot. Aggregating DNS queries across millions of households and scrubbing obvious identifiers does reduce risk. But the risk isn't eliminated, it's relocated. The more dimensions you have, time of day, destination mix, device fingerprints, location, even the quirks of your smart TV, the easier it is to re-identify you as a stream. And that's why regulators tend to look beyond whether a single column in a CSV table contains a name and towards whether the whole data set can be linked back to one. ISPs know this, and the reputable ones design their data products around trends and cohorts because that's powerful enough for advertisers and safe enough to pass audits. But it's still your life's exhaust. As a concrete example, before there was incognito mode, your browser parameters were plainly visible to every site you visited. And with enough parameters like resolution and language and local time zone and so on, pretty soon you have enough data to identify your machine with pretty good statistical accuracy. You could be entirely anonymous by every other measure, but your browser caps announced who you were before you even got in the door. Add a dash of active probing like Canvas and WebGL rendering, audio stack timing and font metrics, and you get a high entropy fingerprint that's startlingly good at telling one machine apart from millions of others. The EFF's Panopticlick made that shock concrete years ago, showing how a handful of parameters could make most browsers globally unique. And that basic result has held up under more formal scrutiny. A sufficiently rich fingerprint can function like a cookie that you cannot delete. If you're wondering how we got here, how we made the bargain where transport encryption is universal but metadata remains lucrative, it's because the web optimized for speed and scale. Content delivery networks consolidated content across shared IP blocks. Browsers auto-filled performance hints that dual-stacked your requests. ISPs built networks that needed to know enough to optimize peering and caching. Along the way, DNS ballooned from a simple phone book into a data vein that carries a little drop of everybody's day. Now, there's also a subplot worth mentioning here. EDNS Client Subnet, or ECS. Now, that's an extension that some resolvers use to hand a small piece of your IP's geography upstream so the servers can return the closest edge point. It's great for performance because your Netflix looks great because you're steered to the nearest node. But it also means that a smidge of your network identity bubbles up beyond your resolver. Many privacy conscious resolvers truncate ECS or disable it entirely. If you value your speed over secrecy, you can choose otherwise. Again, you are the product manager of you. Let's circle back to VPNs because I don't want to be misunderstood. There are situations where a VPN is exactly the right tool. On hostile networks, maybe airports, hotels, conferences, the operator can and will intercept your DNS, force you through captive portals, and sometimes even try to downgrade security. A VPN connection here wraps the entire connection in armor that you bring with you. It's also handy for geo-shifting content, bypassing overeager filtering and hiding traffic from local adversaries who aren't your ISP. Just remember the iron law, the tunnel exits somewhere. On the far end, your VPN provider sees what your ISP would have seen. So you've merely shifted trust. You have not transcended privacy. So are you the product? You are if you're the only one in the room who didn't realize that there was a market for your metadata. And you are if your resolver choice was, well, whatever my router said, and you assumed that HTTPS made you opaque. But you don't have to be, because the recipe for becoming less of a product isn't sexy. It's just a few checkboxes that you set once and then forget. Pick a resolver that you trust, encrypt the path to it, turn on ECH where available, and keep your logs at home as short as your memory of yesterday's passwords. And if you want the belt and suspenders approach, run your own resolver and let your browser use it instead of freelancing to a big name DOH endpoint. You'll still leave a faint outline. Destination IPs can't be helped and patterns are stubborn things, but you'll have turned a high fidelity portrait into a rough sketch. In a world where almost every entity in the chain has both a reason and a way to turn rough sketches into insights and money, that's a meaningful win. One last thought, because I know some of you are performance-minded. Privacy and speed are not mortal enemies. A well-run DOH or DOT resolver on a modern network with caches hot and ECS sensibly trimmed will feel indistinguishable from the default in day-to-day -day use. And if anything, a local recursive resolver at home can make your repeated lookups faster than your ISP's damp old cellar full of aging bind requests. And if something breaks, some cranky IoT light bulb that hard codes your ISP's resolver IP, your edge box can simply refuse the connection and force it to use your own policy. Own your network, or somebody else will. When I ship features at Microsoft, we just say that defaults are destiny. 
The whole reason you can't format a FAT32 SD card any bigger than 32 gigabytes is that's the number that I picked one Tuesday. Whatever you make easy is what most people will live with. And the defaults on consumer networking gear still hand your questions to the ISP, and the ISP still has incentives to mine those patterns in the questions. That's not a conspiracy, it's just a business model. But you are not condemned to it. Change that one setting and the product on the shelf becomes just service again. If you do nothing else after this episode, just open the settings on one device, just one, and enable secure DNS to a provider whose stance you've actually read. Watch nothing else change about your browsing experience and everything change about who's allowed to study it. And then decide whether you want to move that setting into your router or turn it on locally or globally. The pieces are all there now. Encrypted DNS, encrypted handshakes, and an ecosystem that grudgingly admits that you ought to have a say in what your clicks are worth. You can't make your data worthless. You can make it less valuable to the wrong people. And on today's internet, that's the difference between being the customer and being the product. Remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so I would be honored if you consider leaving me one of each before you go today. And if you're already subscribed, thank you. Please check to make sure that you haven't been magically unsubscribed at some point. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.